everybody, uh, good evening and welcome to the second Queensland public meetup of Architects Declare. Let's just begin by acknowledging, of course, the traditional owners of the land on which we're gathered, the Yagara and the Tarrable people, and acknowledging um, our elders past, present and emerging. So this is the second Queensland meetup of the Architects Declare group. Um, welcome tonight and welcome also to everyone that's joining us online. Uh, so my name is Claire Kennedy and I'm joined here tonight by a group of peers really and we've put this evening's proceedings together. So we have Sam and Britt and they're both from JDA and Co. And Ebony, she's from Hatch. And then we've got Tom, he's from Five Mile Radius. And Nick, who is doing all the AV tonight wonderfully. And then also we've had some input from Laura and Susie from Surroundings. And so really I'm just going to talk through a bit about the last event. We all gathered in the same place about two months ago and we talked as a group about actions that really could be undertaken under the various Architects Declare points. And it was an amazing evening. We had a, over 120 of you here and then we had I think about another 120 joined us online. So, you know, it was quite a big turnout and... Uh, we kind of took that quite seriously and really looked at the results of that evening. So there are two main things that we want to go and do with you tonight. So the first one is we want to inspire you with people who are already working in our local community. And the second one is we're going to outline like a framework of how we can work together in Queensland to actually get shit done because that's really what we want this Architects Declare to be about is action. Um, so I'm just going to hand over to Britt about what you said to us about the survey and the last meeting we had. Hey guys. Um, so I'll be going through some key findings. Um, we started a conversation at the last meeting and then since then we had about a third of the um, participants from last meeting responding to uh, an online survey. Um, so the top five actions that we found that you're interested in um, st starting to make an impact on uh, lobbying the AIA's national awards criteria. Um, number two is collectively developing a standard specification sheets uh, to establish better baselines for future projects. Uh, developing metrics for capital costs and life cycles. Uh, undertaking a group review of new government policy. And collectively encouraging the use of locally made materials in all of our practices. Um, so that feedback has really helped us to shape the format of the future events. It's also uh, given us a better understanding of what action you want to see happening and how we can best support you to make those changes happen. So with that in mind, we combine the survey data, um, the last me meeting's minutes, feedback from the National Committee, uh, and we've formed a series of impact areas. The idea here is to bring together people with similar passions and interests to form smaller action groups um, so I'll now pass on to Ebony, who's going to go through and tell us all about how this is going to work going forward. So I have the pleasure of explaining to you a culmination of a few, quite a few weeks of work. And so introducing the action program, we've got a bit of a rough timeline. So that's just going to run over the course of the year and it's going to start this evening. And then our mentoring program. So the key thing that we want to provide is support of all kinds. Um, and that's going to probably begin from the end of April. So we're going to ask the floor. If you feel like you have skills to offer and it doesn't necessarily just have to be in architecture, we really want you to be involved. We have something really exciting coming up. In a couple of weeks, a fantastic workshop. It is optional. And that is called the Surroundings Ideation Workshop. So ultimately, this is kind of in a nutshell what Architects Declare is going to look like this year. We have a survey form where you can register your interest in any one of these categories. You can register to be a mentor. You can also register your interest in the workshop with surroundings. We haven't launched that date yet, but we will really soon. You can register an action group. So if you already have a team, you're working on a great project, you, know, you can register that as well. And if you have an action idea, 
but that's really where we're aiming to go and um, we'll be feeding you more details very soon. So one of the slides that I skipped over at the very beginning was that this is a work in progress. So um, we've developed this idea of having monthly engagements that engage you and inspire you and the mentor stream that will support you in what you're already doing or what you're working towards, building towards the General Assembly uh, in a few months' times where we'll really kick some of these things uh, up a gear. So one of the things that we're aware of is that there are already people doing great work right now and who have great ideas. So we're going to hear from five of them and I'm just going to introduce the first one who is Liz. Hey everyone, my name is Liz Brogdon. It's really a pleasure to be here tonight. I've been asked to give a very quick introduction of myself and a bit of a, I guess, an uh, explanation of the work that I do. Um, but I'd also really like to hear from you guys afterwards. So please, if, you, if anything I say resonates, please feel free to come and talk to me and share with me what you're doing and what your ideas are and keep the conversation going. So I'm a lecturer at QUT and I teach into the architecture course. Um, my research is inspired by how to embed disaster resilient design within architectural education and I guess that sort of links really closely with climate change adaptation and mitigation and action. So yeah, I think that um, I'm inspired by making sure that um, architectural education resonates with students and I think that it's becoming increasingly evident that um, our graduates and our students now are quite apprehensive about the future that we're being exposed to more and more concerning facts about um, the way things are headed environmentally and in our built environment, and that it's disingenuous for architectural education to not respond and to not acknowledge these issues in the education that we're providing. So uh, my next venture is going to be branching out from architecture and teaching all seven design disciplines at QUT within their new design degree. So I'll be co-coordinating Impact Lab 3 Planet. And in that unit, we'll be looking at global issues such as disaster risk, informal settlements, development projects. And of course, it's really hard to address those topics without acknowledging the underpinning fact that climate change is a very real um, factor for communities worldwide. So I guess I'll finish off with um, three main points that I try to instill when in um, the classes and the students' minds when I'm teaching. And the first one is that when we're talking about sustainability or climate change or disaster resilient design, we need to be thinking about this from a transdisciplinary perspective. So it's not all about architecture and design, and we need to start acknowledging the and incorporating um, ways of thinking beyond the discipline of architecture. And not just in the way that we're designing, but also to start looking at the problem itself as transdisciplinary. Secondly, I think that um, collaboration is key that as a profession we don't necessarily have a great reputation for being collaborative with other disciplinary approaches. And that's why I'm particularly excited about the Impact Lab unit because it's going to get our architecture students and all the other six disciplines that I'm really looking forward to getting closer to understanding to work together to solve some of these really big global problems. And finally, I would really like to see architects embracing the notion of process design. So I think that it's important that we recognise that sometimes built things and stuff isn't actually the solution, and that maybe even designing ourselves out of the equation is what's the most sustainable outcome. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. Uh, the next person is Emma. I'm feeling pretty sheepish about talking about this subject. I'm actually not an expert or authority on it at all. I did think it was worth raising, though. Um, I've just become aware of um, some avenues you can take if you want to seek some, I think it was Hunter at the last um, meetup, obviously raised the point that we have uh, a great cultural authority on our, on our land who has a lot of embedded knowledge, tens and thousands of years of embedded knowledge of um, sustainable ways of using um, our country and working with country. So um, there are actually avenues we can pursue and I wasn't aware of that until recently. Um, getting involved with two projects in particular where we were given the opportunity to have cultural awareness training um, and cultural heritage training. So um, I really just wanted to mention that um, there was a lot of, there's a lot of information out there and a lot of ways you can invest in Indigenous organisations, Indigenous-led organisations to access, access that information. 
um, cultural awareness training. Um, Emma Scragg, who's also here, did some um, cultural awareness training with me for a project we've been working on um, through Black Card, but there's other organisations you can, you can contact about that. But um, you can do cultural heritage training specific to a particular area. So knowing the um, cultural authority for the area that your project is on, where you live and where you work is really important and seeking out those connections, I think, um, I've personally just recently become more aware of in my, my area, I live at Capera, there's um, a group at The Gap where you can contribute to a pay the rent scheme or it's, I think it's called a restoration fund. So um, if you do a little bit of research, I think we can start to make inroads into how we can access, um, make, make connections with the indigenous groups that um, are active in our areas and um, yeah, just educate ourselves and make those connections, yeah. Thanks, Emma. So if you are interested, please, uh, I'm volunteering Emma to, to be a person to talk to after the, we wrap up tonight. Uh, the next person is Paul Matthew. Good evening, my name's Paul Matthew. I'm a HDR student at University of Queensland. I'm looking at a project to sort of maintain and extend the life of older multi-residential buildings. So I have some slides to basically explain the importance of life cycle energy assessment to architects. Okay, so when we think about energy use in the built environment, we're often thinking about the energy that we use to heat water, light our buildings, that sort of stuff. When you look at this, you can see Queensland's energy use on average is much lower than southern states. We do much less heating, we're much more comfortable generally. So we're, we're looking kind of good there. When you look into this more deeply, you can see energy use for thermal comfort in Queensland is tiny. It's a small, small, small fraction of total energy use. Um, much more energy goes into appliances, to your TV, your laptop, or things like that. Uh, so life cycle energy looks at much more than this. Operational energy is, those, is the actual you know, heating and cooling and, and sort of power you use on a daily basis. Initial embodied energy looks at all the energy that goes into mining, extracting, refining, transporting building materials and assembling them into a building. And there's another important component, which is the energy used in maintaining buildings over their entire lifespan. So when you repaint a building, when you replace a kitchen, when you replace a stainless steel bench or basin, all of these are, have, a, have a large important impact on total life cycle energy use. Also important is the, the overall lifespan of a building. So these are broad general ratios of the way energy is used. So at the very left end, you've got short lifespan buildings, 50 years or so. Of those, the initial embodied energy of the initial construction is the largest component. And a relatively small amount is maintenance and a small amount is operational energy use. As you get to the right side and you get up to very long building lifespans, Initial embodied energy is much less important and the amount of energy that goes into replacing and repairing components increases. You can also see that occupational energy use, which is appliances, hot water, thermal comfort, that forms a larger and larger component. So understanding the lifespan of our buildings and choosing appropriate materials is vital to reduce our overall impact. Um, and one final slide. Okay, it looks like I missed the final slide. The final slide basically looks at energy use per year of a building's life. And the longer a building lives, the less it uses over that life. And the reason for that is the initial embodied energy is spread over an increasingly long period. So my, my pitch to you as architects and people involved in the design world, think about your buildings, think about how long they're likely to live and choose appropriate materials for that. If you're working on interior fit outs that might be turned over in five years, the last thing you want is concrete, unrecyclable steel, composite materials, things like that. But if your building is going to last 250 years, super low maintenance materials, and even things like composites, if they're incredibly durable, can become really viable and sensible and sustainable materials. That's my pitch. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Matt. Hey guys, my name's Matt Seddon, I'm an architect at Hamshalley and I just want to discuss some of the things that we're trying to do to bring our quite commercial level architecture practice and national architecture practice into more aligned with sustainability goals, which can be difficult just purely because of scale and other demands. So 
first goal is to create demand from the supply chain and from what suppliers bring to the table. Specifying is one of our strongest and most powerful tools and we all know deep down we don't probably wield it as well as we should. So one of the ways that I want to try and create demand is everyone who comes to our office to do a presentation, we give them a checklist of all these different sustainability goals and they've got to answer those to, in order to be accepted as a product that we'll include on one of our schedules. Um, creating positive habits. We're all creatures of habit and we'll often resort to things that we already know in order to save time and to get the job across the line. So especially on large commercial things, we want to make things that save people effort. So we're aiming to take our existing uh, keynote schedules and schedules, finishes schedules, FF and E schedules, and pre-filling them with things that are already sustainable. We'll find the most uh, environmentally friendly plasterboard and have that in there because most of our project will have plasterboard. And then if it becomes an effort to take that stuff out rather than having to have to go out and find what the most sustainable plasterboard is and then bring that into our project. And create empowerment, which is exactly what this whole group is about. It's about we've established a group in our firm called the National Sustainability Forum where we'll try and get information from groups like us, go and find extra things, find interesting articles and share them on our own intranet platform. So this is an example of our checklist that we give out to suppliers. If anyone wants a copy of this, absolutely, you can share it with, get it off these guys and get it off me. Um, if we start hammering suppliers with demands for, oh, we really want to know what your sustainability goals are, then suddenly they're like, oh, shit, we should probably find out what our sustainability goals are. Like, it doesn't even matter really what they answer. This is more about getting in their head and saying, we're demanding sustainability stuff. This is an example of our keynote schedule. And you can see we've got a couple of products in there. We just use as a template and people can swap them out, but our template should be better than best practice. And um, one of the forums, like the sustainability forum, how that group works. And we don't have to carry the whole burden ourselves, like get other groups involved. We've got a national design forum and a, um, champions of change, so we try and bring the social element in as well, because we've got, not everyone can win all battles, triple bottom line wise. So if you can share that with your company, share that with the people around you, then you can make a big difference. Thank you. Got Laura and Susie. Hi, I'm Susie Wiley and this is Laura Pasco from Surroundings. We um, used to be architects, but now um, work with architects and clients at the front of projects to um, do human-centred workshops and processes and interactions to define a better brief. And I guess our thought about that is that um, through defining a better brief, then that, that building that is eventually built is more appropriate and therefore may last longer and have less swap-outs, as, um, as Paul was talking about. So it's all about getting the best fit building for the clients and the users of the building. And I think sometimes offsetting the kind of cookie cutter, um, what does that type of building look like, let's build another one, um, and, and getting a bit more local and fitted. And sometimes maybe designing something smaller if you can, which is kind of the ultimate sustainable goal, but definitely not the ultimate economic goal for a practice. So that's a bit of a tension. Yeah, it's a tension, but also I guess the work that we're doing often with residential clients and with other architects is to help people define whether they even need to, you know, need to do an extension um, or whether the house that they're in at that time is the most appropriate house. It might be better that they sell it and buy a more appropriate one and not do the work. So it's just thinking kind of outside of our training. Yeah, I might give an example. Um, we worked with a school, St Augustine's, with Maxi Rush Architects and they were doing a master plan so we came on board with Maxi Rush and did some workshops with students and staff. So sort of, we do um, card sorts and drawings and mapping and all that sort of thing to say what's working and what's not working on campus. A lot of the outcomes at that school were heat related it's out near Ipswich. They had three ambulances last year taking students away from heat stress. Um, they don't have air conditioning, but that's what everyone was demanding. But actually the outcome from the master plan was largely landscape related. A large landscape comp set of projects, shade trees, ways to open up classrooms, outdoor learning, misting, 
um, and, and sort of tackled, sure, they might get air conditioning as well, but tackling sort of the broader issues and the actual locations required. So in that project, I think um, a traditional approach to master planning might have led to a lot more built form that might not necessarily have an answered the, the problem. Um, one, we haven't started this yet, but we were talking about how could we apply our skills and our practice easily to the challenge of climate action. Um, we do work with a lot of uh, residential architects. We go in and do a workshop with them and their clients at the start. So we thought we could develop a set of sustainable tools, briefing tools, to work through with clients to develop a better sustainable brief. Often the, um, the clients themselves don't know the options out there, so part of the tool's job is to bring in content, trigger conversations, and um, which is the shared value sort of moment, um, and discuss content to kind of inform the brief. Yeah, historically when we've designed tools, I guess we've gone on our own architectural experience and on intuition and also our experience um, with humans and personal development. Um, but I guess with this will be a really good um, evolution of, of uh, us as a practice to get advice from, from other engineers and, and experts on sustainability and disaster relief and all of those kind of things so that we can develop a tool that then can be used on all of the projects that, that we work on. And our intention is to open source it. So we want to, we think that's a good idea for this climate action in general is um, if people are willing to um, do some creative commons and some open sourcing and sort of give each other a bit of a head start. Awesome. So that actually concludes the main part of our evening. I just wanted to... Uh, invite you guys to open up your Instagrams and follow the link. Um, there's a really simple survey, there's about five or six questions and it asks what area of action you're interested in. Uh, we heard from a variety of different areas tonight and our main goal is to try to connect you to each other. Um, so we need to know who you are and what, what you care about basically. Uh, and the other is to give us feedback on how we went tonight and what you think of what we've proposed to you. Uh, in addition, if you have uh, a lot of knowledge in an area, uh, please sign up because um, we're going to hit you up and uh, hopefully get your expertise. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs>